So today we are going to, to, to complete our discussion about visual design. Um, but before doing that, let me answer to a question that already three groups asked me. So let's try to answer once for all. Uh, and the question is, in the PowerPoint for the feedback, should we include uh, the screens of the paper prototypes or just the high-level flow? And the answer is both. Mm -hmm. So you will need to, to include the paper prototype, like a scan or a picture of every, let's say, every screen of the paper prototype in a visible way so that we can scroll in the slides and see the details of the paper prototypes, like uh, having them on paper, on, on the table, and the eye level flow with the arrows that connect the various screen. And these screens could be smaller, of course, because we have already seen the details of the paper prototype. And so this is just enough to understand how it's possible to move from one screen, from one page, to another. So in the slides, you need both. The paper prototype, we are looking at them, and the flow to understand how you move from one page to another in the paper prototype. And in some cases, is obvious how you move from one page to another. In other cases, including some prototypes I've seen, is not so obvious. So the flow actually helps us to understand if everything is well connected and done. OK? So this is the overall answer to a question and with that let's move to the visual design part so we are going to talk about three things today one is color the second one is navigation and the third one is still about text and reading so if you remember or if you are in my team uh, i've told a lot of you too much text try to be more concise, try to write less, etc. And we will see at the end of today why to write less in user interface. So, but first, let's talk about colors. So, um, let's start with some like baseline about colors. And let me start with a question about colors. So, are colors a property of an object? like this color is always this color, or they are in some way more subjective and depends on factors. Subjective. They are more, let's say, subjective and depend on factor. Why? Depends on the eye of the user and the, the factor. Well, let's exclude any like kind of defects of, um, about using color. Let's say that um, what, well, what color is this is probably difficult to describe in a war, but let, what color is this? Let's agree on a color for this. It's, well, let's agree on a color. Well, no, this is not a really a good color. Um, let's agree on a color for this. Green, perfect. So is this light green? Can we say light green? I don't know what it did, <laughs> but I did something. And who knows the recording, I will come. Um, so let's say it is dark, uh, light green, OK? Is that light green always? No, because it's sub sort of subjective. When is not light green? So if we turn off the light, that will not look like the same shade of green. Maybe it will look like gray. Hmm? So colors are, of course, subjective according to any uh, defects that one can have in the site, but also are subject as a, not a property hmm, of an object like weight or the, the size or the dimension. These are property of an object. Colors instead are not. Depends, for instance, from the light or for other things. So what we don't want to do is something like this. OK, so what's the problem here? Color side. 
too, too many things is going on here. It's, it's quite a mess. Hmm? Uh, so we don't want this, right? So this is an extreme. Colors, we want to use color as a tool to improve uh, parts of interfaces to communicate, to highlight key information. And inappropriate use of colors like this, this is very inappropriate, um, can severely reduce the performance of an interactive system hmm? in terms of errors, in terms of usability, in terms of finding information, etc. Um, so as general suggestion for picking color, since you will need to pick colors at a certain point for your high fidelity prototype, um, the first suggestion is be careful, do not exaggerate. Hmm? So fewer color, if you don't feel confident, fewer color are better than too many colors. Uh, most importantly, design in grayscale first. That's sort of came for you short, sort of easy from the low and medium fidelity prototype, but design in, in uh, grayscale first because information should be primarily conveyed by text and layout and then by colors. Colors should be there for helping you, for highlighting information. Hmm? But something should be perfectly usable in grayscale and understandable in grayscale. Uh, when ending color, try to conserve the same luminance of the grayscale design. So if something is lighter than another things in grayscale, then the color should respect this lightness of one item to the others. Uh, try to assign meaning to color. So if you use red for all the danger buttons, then all the danger buttons should be red. And if you associate red to danger, to something dangerous to do in a way, then you, don't, you shouldn't use red for not dangerous things. And same things for green and other colors you may, you may want. Uh, use a limited, be careful, do not exaggerate. So use a limited and consistent palette and slight variation. And we will see what, is, what are palettes. And avoid simulated display of pure colors. Uh, especially the extreme one, and the extreme one typically means blue and red, um, especially as pure color. So red is a very brilliant red and a very brilliant blue, for instance. Uh, desaturated combination, so like pastel colors, uh, are better even if they are uh, extreme colors. So why they are called extreme colors? To, to speak about extreme colors, we should I'm not going too much into details, but we will, uh, I will just give you a few information about visible spectrum and highs and how, how highs operate. So this is the visible spectrum. In the spectrum of color we can see uh, in a typically developed person. And uh, on the left of the spectrum, here there is all the ultraviolet wavelength and on the other side there are infrared and things that they don't, we don't see. Uh, so this is the visible spectrum from us hmm? uh, in which it's clear which are the main color that we see. Which are the familiar color that we see? That there is a uh, starting letter but it should be violet. violet. But it's also easy, a red, because it's, there are colors behind. Hmm? So these are the main colors we see. Hmm? Um, and do you know how the eyes work? Just briefly. How the eyes work? How we see? <laughs> they have some receptor that are the cones in English and roads, the bastoncelli are roads in uh, um, in English uh, and to I don't do like lesson to today
back to this blue or red, so we see better green colors uh, respect to the other ones. And uh, of course, we see the co uh, in, the, in our eyes the image is formed upside down respect to reality, and then our brain uh, corrects. Plus, we have also the information to add one yes to Okay, okay, it's fine. Um, so, to sum up what he correctly said. So we have two kinds of receptors in our eyes, the cones and the rods. We have much more rods than cones. Rods are the ones that we use to see in the dark, basically. When we go in a uh, dark room, after a while, we start seeing something. This is due to the rods. Uh, the cones are uh, less than the rods, and there are especially green rods, cones um, in our eyes as in quantity, uh, but we can see uh, we have cones for red, blue, and green, and we use them to generate, in a way, in our brain, all the colors. And uh, we see object in our head, let's say, at the end of the a uh, upside down. So this battle, mm, it's like this, but we see it upside down. Mm. And then it's our brain that operate and put all together to give us the let's say, a realistic perception of things. Uh, this is very briefly. Uh, I told you before, this is just to, to came to a point where I told you before to avoid extreme colors. Mm? Extreme in this sense, like at the extreme of the wavelength of light, at the extreme of the, what the cones perceive. And I told you that the red and the blue are at the extreme. Why are they at the extreme? Look at the picture. Why are they extreme? Because one operates between this point and the other point, but the majority is in this position, the blue one, and the red one is in this position and there is no overlap between basically only here but for the majority there is no overlap between the red cones and the blue cones so if you put blue items and red items on a piece of paper or um, a user interface especially high intensity red and high intensity blue so pure colors our eyes and our visual system makes much more effort to see because it needs to activate red cones and then blue cones and which are uh, and process information that are at the distant size of the wavelength. so it's simple for us but still much more fatigue than for instance using red and green because they are color that overlaps for quite uh, a long quite quite a big part of the of their um, graph mm, or their representation. Mm. So this is just, just to say, again, keep in mind red and blue in the same interface use sparkly, especially high pure colors because of these overlaps that is basically missing. And so this is adding more strain and more efforts and more difficulties in our visual system. So if it's once, doesn't matter, but if a multiple complex uh, user interface, then it can create fatigue longer term. Mm? While pastel color are less sensitive to these and other colors as well. Uh, so this slide summarizes what we, we said basically and what he said actually. So, Keep in mind the human vision is still a highly complex activity, even if it's simple in a way for us. It's not that we, we need to put effort or concentration and focus to do that. And it is uh, often the main source of information about the world. Mm? And the eyes are just a mechanism for receiving light and transforming it into electrical energy so that we, our brain can process it and give us a representation of the world and way to interact with the world. Uh, and this was explain why colors are more, let's say, subjective and not a property, because the eye is a mechanism for receiving light. So according to how light uh, impact the, uh, the objects, then different things can happen. We can see and recognize different colors. Um, 
and if you will do anything with like um, color scale uh, like RGB um, cyan um, uh, S Y M G etc you will see different uh, way to manipulate colors and also from a computational perspective is for instance easier to not use the RGB to manipulate colors but other scales that are more mathematical um, build mathematical models than not the RGB that is built on this basically hmm? the RGB scale because pick one for each cone that we have um, so this is an example on um, designing in grayscale first. So you see, even if without colors, you have exactly the same level of luminosity. And so this button that is blue is a darker gray. And this is the same background and you still keep the same background. This is not white background and you keep it. So you should be able... Hmm, if you look at this, you should be able to operate with it without any problem, without any issues with contrast, background, etc. So if you work on this first and then you assign for any luminance level a suitable color, you have no problem when you move to the color size um, of, uh, of the interface. Instead, if you do something like this, you can see that, well, you cannot see, but it will have you see that in this case, look at the first three, or especially the first two, the, the color used here is different, but in grayscale is actually the same. So if the goal of the color is to convey additional information to highlight something specifically here it's failing because there is no difference between the color for the first tab and the color for the second tab hmm? so in this case the grayscale version should be different and then the color should be different as well hmm? and then everything else is sort of okay as, as a contrast etc but if you see the colored version of this you see that actually these are two different colors. Hmm? But in the grayscale representation, they are not. Hmm? So in this case, they are not serving properly the purpose. And this is actually the old Polytechnic website. I don't know if you ever met him. Met it? Yes. Lucky you. Um, so how to pick colors? Well, there are various ways to pick colors. Um, one quite common way to pick colors is the color wheel or the hue circle um, where basically there are hues hmm? um, so not colors in all their gradation and luminance so light uh, a very light green a slightly less light green a pure green etc etc but just main uh, hue uh, and if you want to, um, to pick a colors, to pick a combination of colors, you should pick one color, like, let's say, yellow, and the complementary colors on the other side of the well. Mm? So opponent's color go well together. Mm? So yellow and orange together don't go very well. They can be used maybe to represent different shades of the same color in a way but yellow and purple or red and green of course red and green not red and blue red and green can be used as complementary color within a user interface hmm? so opponent colors go well together if you need if you say my primary color is let's say orange or blue then i can put together orange together with blue and then play with shade of orange, shade of blue, etc. Hmm? And if you want to, to read more about the color well, there is this page that explains all the also logic behind that about the model. Um, 
one thing that typically is done is was about the among the suggestion is to use palette palette exists especially for existing application companies etc and describe which are the colors you are expected to use with the specific tonalities and the shades of the color so for instance for for polytechnico this is the palette of polytechnico some designers create a design system with these specific colors in polytechnico and everything produced with the polytechnico logo and and landmark should follow this palette including the website all the official material should should follow this palette and there are other examples of palettes uh, but every company has a palette and every design system has some suggested palette like google material design has some suggested palette you can pick on and also palette generator to use uh, and etc and you can also generate palettes so for instance this uh, website colors or coolers dot co can um, generate palette mm? so you pick some colors and then it will generate a palette for you of different colors you can use um, with also the um, hexadecimal description of the color if you need and you can generate a new palette if you don't like it etc and this website instead color lovers uh, as palette and also as patterns and other things to get more inspiration so instead of generating palette you can pick one existing palette that some designer or somebody else created for you and just adopt it hmm? so these are resources to play with color in a safe in a safe way without experimenting too much and color contrast is instead a tool that will allow you to understand if the contrast of the colors you want to use is appropriate Mm -hmm. so you you avoid to write like black text on this color mm -hmm. because obviously that contrast is not enough to um to be visible mm -hmm. so here you should use some something lighter way lighter than black or dark gray etc and all the systems are some palettes done for instance this is the google chrome palette mm -hmm. so google chrome so Google define the palette for Google Chrome and specify a meaning that is something also you can find in the design system like which is the primary, the secondary color, the color for disabled items, for links because it's a web browser, uh, the positive, negative and warning. Hmm? So the primary color in Google Chrome is black, just black. Hmm? The secondary color is uh, uh the same black but with uh opacity alpha applied so it looks like um, less intense and the disabled color is actually black uh, with less with more transparency applied mm -hmm. the link is that blue exactly that blue not another one and that will be coherent across the entire application uh the positive negative and warning are this left this gray this red and this orange and it's again specifically that one and this is defined in one place and used consistently across the entire application doesn't matter in which page you are etc 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 and here there is also the equivalent if the background is instead dark instead of black instead of white Say, ask, say that again. The, cho the choice of color for these two elements, yes. No, what it means you can distinguish? Well, you can not distinguish uh, a, a great variety, but still, sorry <coughs> but still there should be like there is difference between this and this the contrast between this bar here and this bar here see is different 
but it's not different between these and these or between these and these. But it's different between these and these. So that part is not particularly well done compared to these. So here we see much more shade of gray, right? It's not just two. So because all of these correspond to a different shade of yellow and blue. So this, this is carefully done. So in this case is the color version transforming grayscale. What one can do is to do it in reverse and probably stack over for did it. So you start from the grayscale. And then as soon as you find a level of gray that is reasonable and there is enough contrast and is, is it convey information in a different way, like this one and this one are the same and should be the same also in color. And this is different from this, it should be a different color also in color and indeed what they did was exactly this this yellow and this yellow are exactly the same and they are both different from this so they keep the luminance of the of the gray in when they put colors in hmm? this is something that instead the website of Polytechnico didn't do okay this helps with contrast and Again, the goal of colors and just aesthetic is to convey information. So if they don't convey information in a meaningful way, then the purpose colors are is missing in this case. Okay, let's do uh, an example here. Um, so in this case, we have colors in this side here of the page. You you know what is this? I don't I don't remember every year if you know what is this, if you ever use it or not. Is the booking on the portale or it was the booking on the portale hmm? um, okay so what's the pro well what's the problem of colors is written on on the side but why this these are the problem what's the problem with these problems So the slide say three problems. Colors needs an explanation legend. So why this is a problem? Mm. Yeah, but not only. Sorry? Mm, yes, uh, that could be a problem, remember, because it used like five colors, but most importantly, um, if we say that colors are about giving meaning to, um, to, to information, so can we associate the meaning that we expect to we so if we if we don't have this legend now how can I delete this legend like this? If you don't have the legend and And just see this. What is red? What's the purpose of red? What's the meaning of red? Not available. What's the meaning of blue? Mm, what's the meaning of... Uh, there is not here. What's the meaning of uh, gre green? Yeah, because you remember from the legend. Um, what's the meaning of, I don't even know, yellow? Okay, we need to guess. Mm -hmm. So this is the problem. So color should be 
So you, in theory, sh you shouldn't need a legend to explain something with colors, because otherwise, why using color in the first place? Just right here, booked, free, uh, unavailable, and that's it. Mm? So if you need a legend, it is already something that is really not, not good. Uh, time interval are shaded with two different colors. There is a reason why there are two different colors for this time. There is any reason why the first, like 9 to 10 is is red, more red, and more, more intense red, and 10 to 11 is instead lighter red? Absolutely not. Just, we like it that way. Um, so this is again, if color are for adding meaning, we are not adding meaning. We are ask, having people ask questions. Um, and also, since we are using shade of colors, for instance, uh, and thinking that colors are there to add meaning, why not using, for instance, a shade of blue that fills up until 36 to 36? Like if it's 1 out of 36, is a very light blue, and if it's 34 to 36, is almost a pure blue. So since there is space and there is uh, colors, why don't you add a meaning to these colors? Hmm? And here is absent. Uh, okay, so this is about colors. So uh, again, we, we are not going to, to be expert in colors. We are not designers. And so we rely on other things, but we try to avoid this, this. And we want to avoid this. Hmm? Uh, and in the middle, there are suggestions and a series of suggestions. Uh, sorry, a series of tools like the color well, the palettes, generators, etc., and design system that you can rely on. And if you are creating, for instance, an application for, well, for the web is more complex, but for mobile, for Android, or iOS, or a macOS application, they have guidelines. Remember we mentioned guidelines when we talk about principles and theories? They have guidelines that also tell you which are the colors to be used. Mm? So your application to be compliant, standard with the device that you're going to use should follow the same guidance and then you have flexibility in giving uh, other parts that are not prescribed by this. Mm? And design system in general, like the Google Material Design, have definition of colors and usage for Colors, font, size, etc. Okay, so next topic, reading and navigating. Um, navigation. Navigation is what we use to know uh, where people are within a user interface and to move from one page to another until we reach a destination. Um, so it's about a series of action that brings down from point A to point B, where point B is hopefully where we want to go. And it may consist of three types of navigation, the task navigation, uh, the web navigation, or the app navigation, and the command menu navigation. So the task navigation is operating successfully interactive applications, like installing an app, completing. So it's more navigation within a task, with the same definition of task we gave. Uh, the web navigation or within an app uh, navigation is finding information within hmm, the, um, uh, the application or the web page or browsing the application web page. And the common menu navigation is instead finding information within a menu. Hmm? And again, navigation has nothing to do with visual elegance, not even with colors in, in some way. And there are various ways to navigate. I will go quite... Um, quick on this because you are all experienced but as users on this. So there are menu bars are part of navigation. Uh, Pop-ups menus are part of navigation because interrupt the navigation or brings, provide um, a different path to navigate. Toolbars, ribbons are all things that you can use for navigate. Uh, shortcut are expert tool for navigation. 
still are gestures for rapid interaction. It's not for everybody, but it's still something that if one person remember and want to use, could uh, provide a navigation by selection. Uh, list to scroll down are still navigation and etc. And shortcuts are like tap, not only uh, control S, etc., but also long tap, long press, double tap, swipe, swipe on the top, long swipe, etc. Mm? Uh, pinch a spread, mm? like for zooming, etc. So all of these are shortcuts to enable different level navigations. Uh, of course, right buttons and check boxes are other things that can guide navigations um, as well. In web and mobile applications, especially menus, hmm, and in part also in desktop application, uh, menus are the main component for navigation, as you know. And um, the trouble with menu is how you organize content within them, hmm, especially if you have a lot of content. So if you have like three actions and that's it, that's easy because you have three actions. At, worst, at most you have three buttons in a menu. So not a big issue. But if you have hundreds, if you are tasked with design the menu for Amazon.com, what do you put in the menu? Hmm? Do you put the categories? Do you put the kind of device? Do you put alphabetically and which is the order? Longer text, shorter text, alphabetically, A to Z, new to old. Mm? So the trouble with menu organization is the menu is actually the organization of the content when you have multiple information or this information change across time at a certain point you need to uh, redo them. Um, because organizing men menus in a meaningful way results in faster selection time for the user and higher user satisfaction. That is something we, we want. Um, and there are multiple approaches. There is the linear uh, sequence, like in a survey. Mm -hmm. uh, so you move from one item to another, and new things appear. A hierarchical structure, like a tree, or a network structure, like a network computer network structure. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of tree-like content navigation. You have categories, like shop array, shop array outlet, travel with, etc. You have subcategories, and then selecting one subcategories, multiple options, a tree of options appears under that, hmm? with a header for each item, and then some subcategory with that. Hmm? So this is a tree-like content organization, because you start with the main element, that is shop array, and then you select cycle, and then within cycle you have categories, bikes, helmets, clothing, shoes, accessory, etc. And then within each of them, you have mountain bikes, road bikes, etc., etc., etc. So this is a tree that uh, span out in uh, a way uh, with pros and cons. Hmm? So one thing is that these occupy a lot of space on screen, on a web application. And how do you again order this? Is alphabetical order? Is both object first? Is bigger object first? It left decision uh, to the user. And, and then here, they probably didn't know where to, to put this, maybe instead of the advertisement. Uh, they also had some other four. This could be one, one critique to do in this interface. There are other four items just put there in the end of the menu, hmm? like leaves of a tree that are not really linked with anything. Hmm? Because tree like content organization of big um, website is actually compli complicated and complex. Hmm? So which rule we can use if you need to organize a menu in a form that is tree like? Uh, first of all, use task semantics to organize menu, like all the bikes together, all the accessories together, etc. Uh, limit the number level. Mm -hmm. So prefer broad to, shar to shallow, then, um, so prefer starting bigger, like um, what was here, uh, cycle, and then go in, in detail. 
Uh, create groups of logically similar items, logically similar items, not alphabetically similar, like level 1, level 2, level 3, etc. Uh, groups should cover all possibilities. You should have 0, 9, 10, 19, 20, 29, and more than 30 if you're talking about ages, uh, like in a way, in a, in a survey, uh, and not 0, 9, and then 11, 20, because there is a gap in the middle. Uh, make sure that items are not overlapping. Hmm? For instance, concert and sports are fine and are better than entertainment and events because both concert and sport can be events, can include events. And both concert and sport can be used for entertainment. So this is ambiguous as a definition uh, and overlaps. I arrange item by natural sequence, not alphabetically, and again group them and keep ordering fixed. So don't change ordering between one, let's say, menu of all item and the other. Uh, so, and if you need, you du can duplicate, of course. So, and then what is the natural sequence? The natural sequence may mean different things. Could be, again, um, by ages, could be uh, by things that are sold more. And so you put first the things you sell more, that your customer clicks on more, and then um, in the end, more difficult to reach things that nobody buy or almost nobody buy. So there could be some logical natural sequence in some way when you create a menu big like this. Uh, so let's make another example about navigation. So again, this is the same tool as before, right? Sorry, it's in Italian, but... So how it works, this tool? How does it work? You click on a category, so study room, by, um, library, and secretarian, and uh, a new part appear. So if you click on study room, a new part appear, and there are options, and then? And then? I click an option, and the same calendar as before uh, uh, appear. So uh, we talk already about colors. So on a navigation perspective, which are the problems here? Just on a navigation or visual design perspective, you want to keep it larger. Hmm? Yes. So that's one problem. So the arrow is typically something that you expect to expand and instead doesn't expand and create a new line and then create a new line uh, on the bottom of the page. So if you have a limited screen, you are missing things that are going on on the bottom. Then imagine you cannot absolutely read Italian or any Western language. So you have no idea what is written here. You can't understand it, like the father, where it comes from. You cannot understand where the second or the third layer comes from. Hmm? Because like if you click on study room, that study room, well, either should expand, but since it's not expanding there and create a new space, should be at least like highlighted because I was is enabled hmm, in some way so not stay in the same in the same color uh, then we talk a little bit about text and we will talk a little bit about text later but text wise is it fine who say that is fine okay who say that as some issues, text related. And which are some of these issues? Text. 
in which mean the hierarchy? Oh, yes, they are not the same. They don't decrease in tax, you mean. Mm -hmm. And then? Yeah, the color of the category is the same as before. So we already cover it. Oh, yes, you can also have different colors for different categories. Like I select study room and it's green and um, library, it is yellow, okay? And then, especially if you understand Italian. It's not consistent. So, Aula Studio, those are study rooms, uh, then becomes Sala Studio, that is in English is still study rooms, but is different. Um, and then probably some, some, some way change names again. Um, so coherent, if you pick a name, just use the same name. Because people can ask if there is a difference between a Aula Studio, study room, or a Sala Studio. What's the difference? Uh, and I don't know what happens if you click on the others, but uh, it's it. And then, oh, let's look at this. Sorry, let's look at this. I'm sorry, uh, I will try to translate. Starting from July 15, 2020, uh, you can use the following uh, study room uh, in in, this, in the main campus that is study room at the second floor of Corso Castelfidardo 39 local code TO underscore CIT 11 underscore XP 02 underscore 001 and let's stop here so there is information that is totally useless here yes which is the local code because the local code is something that is on a map, on, on the, the internal maps, of course, every room has a co local code. Also, this room has a local code. But this is totally useless for a student. You don't, it, nobody remembers them. Hmm? Um, it's better to say how to reach it, maybe. And then let's look at the other text. Uh, study rooms are open 9 to 6 p.m., Monday to Friday. Access is allowed on two uh, slots one from 9 to 1 p.m and the other one from 2 p.m to 6 p.m now do some maths that should be needed do some maths and tell me where is the problem here they are not open from 9 to, to, to 6 because 1 p.m to 2 p.m they are closed so instead of saying study room are open 9 to 6, Monday to Friday, and then specify that actually 9 to 1 and 2 to 6, just say immediately, less text. Study room are open 9 to 1 and 2 to 6, Monday to Friday. Half of that text, same message. And we will see in a while, even better, opening time of study room. Nine, Monday to Friday, 9, 13, to 14, 16. Hmm? Without using study rooms are open on all these things people don't read generally, uh, especially on, don't read what they need to read, but especially on web interface. And so it should be as easy as possible and as concise as possible. And then there will be other things, but we're not, I don't want to say here, half an hour. Uh, here there is a good example of menu grouping. Hmm? Uh, there are three groups. Uh, the first one are the template style, and then there are the frequently used fonts, and then there are all the fonts. Uh, it's actually good. It's a long menu. This is the font menu on any... Um, word processor application this is a good grouping so first of all it show you which are the fonts of the template of the document you're using in, the, in theory those are the fonts you should use more frequently and so they are put on the top of the menu the second one are the frequently used to fonts and again these are the frequently used so easier to reach and then 
if you don't want a template font and don't want a frequently used font, there are everything else. Uh, in this case, there is alphabetical order within each group. That makes a lot of sense because there is no natural order for fonts. Uh, even if it lacks semantic order, you can imagine to categorize them in like comics, like font, serif, some serif, and you should find categories that are not overlapping, of course. Another good point is, of course, that there is preview. You can see what a font looks like before uh, applying it. Mm? And this is somewhat recent as, uh, as an application mm? until 20 years ago. More or less, you don't have preview on fonts. You have to select the text and try every single font that you want in a document for 15 minutes until either you find something you like or you stop because you are, are wasting too much time. And this is scrollable. So there are actually some very good examples here. Uh, and then, There is the concept of information sent. Uh, we'll click quickly, and there should be something in the application that always tells the user where to go without having them uh, lost. Mm -hmm. So how do you recognize poor information sent? For instance, the back button is used too frequently. I'm lost. I'm going somewhere, and then I go back. And then I go somewhere, and then I go back. When it's used too frequently, then it's poor information sent. Um, low confidence, a person doesn't know confidently if they can do that action or not, if it breaks something or not, etc. And Or they actually do say that they don't know where to go. You see, hmm, maybe you're doing like contextual inquiry observation, you see people using an application and just they don't, for the first time, they just don't know where to click to go to accomplish a task. Hmm? So this is poor information sent. And this information sent are Q, to suggest where to find information. These cues are the things we are used to use, in a, but in a proper way, like icons, menus, etc. And you have, have, maybe you need to update these slides one day or another. Did you ever see this version of the website? Yes, okay, so I have still a few years. Um, so this page has one huge problem for information sent. Not this page per se, but what happens when you click on one of these boxes. When you click on these boxes, what happens is that every box brought you to something that has a totally different layout from the original page and from each other. So if you are able to navigate like this page that is still present, so we still have this problem, this page has totally different organization, totally different use of color with respect to this one. So here, the orange one are more student service, day-to-day um, -day student service, but here the orange one is um, the, the curricula and the syllabi for the, for the year. Um, and the bachelor program and master program are green, which are still student services. And here orange is yet another thing. And here orange is research activity announcements, so nothing to do with student. And also different layout, different graphics, different user color. This is easy. This is a good example of a bad information sent because if you are able to navigate like this here, you go here and you have to relearn, in a way, to navigate hmm? again. And still today, if I'm asking you to find the information about um, the, the dates for the master thesis, for the deadlines for the master thesis, uh, I will probably need to give you like 10 minutes to find them. And, and if I need to ask you which are the dates for the discussion for computer engineer, then it's probably I will need to give you 10 to 20 minutes to, 
to have you find them. And there are somewhere on the website, on the current website, there are this information, just is not easy to find them. Hmm? Uh, so if you want to, to experiment how bad is navigation, just try to find this information and look at how much time you, 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 you need to. Hmm? Um, so common problems in these areas are unexpected categories. There is a category that shouldn't be there. Uh, links that are too short, so it's not descriptive enough. The navigation is hidden somewhere, and I don't know, and it obviously changing from one page to another, or icons are too generic or not easy, uh, easy to recognize. Mm -hmm. uh, so icons should facilitate recognition of a recall uh, when they're used consistently and frequently visible. And redundant coding, icon plus text, for instance, helps memorization and helps recognition hmm? across website, across applications, and within an application. Uh, links always use multi-word links, especially on the web. On the web, there is an accessibility guidelines that say the text in a link should be fully described what the destination of the link is, and you cannot fully describe it with one word. Um, so not click here. Here is not a full description of the goal of that link, but the next assignment template, it is the destination of that link. So multi-word link, descriptive links, especially on the web, but even if you have other links in internal applications. Uh, straight language, not jargon. Hmm? Unless you are in a very specific domain where jargon is well known, in general, try to use like spreadsheet for computing score instead of scoromatic that could resonate to someone but not to other people uh, blocks navigation should be self-explanatory sometimes they have these subtitles and in this case uh, forms similarly should group logically similar items I use section dividers titles there should be real-time error checking, validation feedback, possible suggestion for correction, like the password is too short, or the strength of the password is okay, or the name cannot be empty, etc. And there should be an explicit uh, submit form to give the sense of completeness of a task for the user. But these are partially things you have met in the web application, partially. Uh, and then there are, of course, form elements, user interface elements that are common and standard that you can use in your application as they are. Maybe you change color, you ch change a little bit the style, but they have a specific meaning, a specific semantic. Mm? Uh, so for instance, uh, let's use one, an easy one. What's the difference between a checkbox and a ballot like this? Yes. So in the checkbox, you can have multiple selection. In the other one, the selection should be only one. You cannot select yes or no. Good. Um, OK. Finally, about reading. Uh, I already told you which is the answer to this question. Which is the answer to this question? Say it louder. They don't read, exactly. And it's also in the slide. Um, they don't. So what people do, uh, well, let's skip that for a second. What people do is actually this. Hmm? So these are two um, advertisement, one from Rebook and the other one, I don't know from whom. Anyway, uh, the red area is, so they had an instrument that is called a night tracker, and they had people looking at this page. Like, show the page and where the tension goes on and where people look. And if it's red, is where the tension goes for the people that look at that images in that, uh, in that page. So, how many people look at the brand? No one. So if you put some important information 
here and you want people to look there in this case it was the brand which is sort of important as information for for them uh, nobody look at that nobody they look at the colors, they look at the pictures, they look at people, etc. Um, so this is an experiment, just briefly. Uh, this is done with a tool that's called eye tracker. Do you know what is an eye tracker? Yeah. Yes. All of them? All of you? What is an eye tracker? It's a device that tracks where we are looking at. Pixel to pixel is not precise enough to go pixel to pixel. Uh, and it's made with cameras, infrared cameras, that try to get your uh, eyes and where you are gazing. And you can also see how long you are gazing in a specific position. And you also can do a scan path, so like the here, so there are different ways to visualize uh, the outcome, the output of an eye tracker. One is the head map, like that one, where you can see red is where all people, most people look at, and then as you go towards the white, you uh, decrease the number of people. Or the scan path, in which you don't only see big circle where people are looking at, but also the path between one position to another. So people looks here and then moves here and then moves there, etc. Mm? So the path of, of, of looking in the page. Um, and, and there are studies done with uh, eye tracker that, for instance, show where people look on the web. Mm? So in the Google search page, people, where people look? At the top, first results, in the sidebar, where should be contextual, important information. And then, why the look on the bottom? To change page. Mm -hmm. And basically, these results was not, in this experiment, was not looked by anyone. Mm -hmm. So if you are the first element in page two, you probably have higher chance to be seen than the fourth element on page one. Mm -hmm. um, and typically, people look at the top left corner of the page most of the time and then move in that um, in that size like in this picture mm -hmm. so these are studies made with eye tracker that uh, describe these things and describe in a quantitative way what these slides say that people don't actually read for instance on the website but they scan the page they look for the information that are important, the queue of information that are important for their task at the moment. So if I am on this website and I want to buy a ticket, I will look for buy ticket and synonyms. I will not look for uh, track my miles or for the about page because I want, I have a task that is buy my ticket to go on holiday. And that's the other information I'm looking for. I'm scanning to the page until I find something that resonates to this, and then I click on that. And everything else in the page is noise. So this is the behavior they typically have. And was also not done with a tracker, but also with an experiment. So basically, uh, in this experiment, they use a baseline text, the first one about Nebraska, description of Nebraska, as a baseline. And then they applied to these four different variation of the text, uh, more concise. Mm? And with a more concise text, they get an increment of 58% in usability with respect to the longer version. Then they start from the longer version, and they, and they create a scannable layout with bullet points. And they get an improvement of 47 so less text is slightly better in this experiment than a scannable layout. Uh, an objective language, hmm, so neutral language more than subjective, brought an improvement of 27%. Hmm, but the most interesting thing is the combined version, the version that has a neutral language, concise text, and 
scannable layout with bullet points, etc., this brought to a 124% improvement with respect to the baseline. Mm? So every time I told you try to simplify the text, reduce the text, is because of this. Mm? Because easier text to scan, mm? so scannable layout, and shorter in term in, mm, will have higher chance for people to read it and then understand it and then act in the correct way that you in the way that is correct for your application. Hmm? Otherwise, you can expect errors and you need to find a way to recover for errors. That is in any case, but this is also calling for trouble. Hmm? Uh, so where to put content in general, especially in the web, but this is also true on mobile, but especially on the web, on the web uh, above the fold, hmm? that means in the page you see on the screen, in the first part of the page you see on the screen without scrolling, uh, and putting content above the fold means prioritizing what you want to put, designing what you want to put in the first part of the page, not making everything smaller so that it can fit in a lesser space. Um, so first about the fold, second where people expect, again, I said to multiple groups, look for and also last time in the exercise about paper prototype look at the standard we'll look what other mobile application do look at what others what are the standard because this is where people expect things to be and especially especially on the web not where the advertisement usually go because we we become very very expert in ignoring the area where advertisement is so if we put significant content where an advertise typically is, people will likely miss it. So avoid areas where the advertisement are and learn, remember that user will scroll down the page only if the content above the fold is interesting. Otherwise they will not scroll down, they will change page. They will click somewhere else. They will close your application or website in general. Mm. And this is an example of the banner uh, blindness, the advertisement, mm, the advertisement. So since advertisement are typically put in some position specifically, we automatically learn to just, our brain automatically learn to skip it mm. without thinking. We know that advertisement is always on, 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 the, on the right or between chunk of information. So if there is something between chunk of information that looks like an advertise, we will just skip it. And even if it's not, we skip it anyway. So automatically, we, we, we learned about it again automatically. So try not to, uh, to fall over the same, the same lead. Okay, so this close visual design. We talk about uh, a few different things. Uh, some of them are already useful for the paper prototype. Some others like colors will be, or concise text will be more useful when you move to the uh, high fidelity prototype specifically since there we should be realistic content uh, one more thing uh, we will not related to this like more general uh, information two more things one we will publish the same schedule for the feedback session uh, as assignment one and we plan to keep it the same uh, order uh, so if you have any problem with that order, just tell me as soon as possible. Otherwise, we will publish the same order as last time. Uh, the feedback session will be in a sala colloquy, not in the same place of last time because it's booked already. Uh, sala colloquy is a, is a room, fourth floor, uh, on top of the general secretariat. You have to take the elevator uh, close to um, the secretariat. Uh, at ground at the ground level and oh the third thing is that in this week we will also publish the assignment three that is a risk evaluation that is the individual assignment so that you will also start to see how your prototype how are both your prototype will need to be evaluated uh, in the coming weeks and tomorrow we will start talking about a risk evaluation with that have a good evening and see you tomorrow.